High level builds are a ton of fun in Baldur's Gate 3, but it's a long road to get to the gate in the first place, and the first act of the game can be considered one of the hardest parts of the game, in fact, while your builds are still coming online. With the ability to respec your characters at any point, the build options are endless, but there are a few builds that Monty and I stuck with through the entire game. So here are four builds that you can start with and use all the way through Baldur's Gate 3. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today we're sharing four early game builds that you can start with right away at level one, two, three in Baldur's Gate 3 and take all the way to the end of the game. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. Before we get to the builds, this week's episode of our show is sponsored by Amaria, a new 5th edition compatible campaign setting that is now live on Kickstarter. Amaria introduces four pillars of power in their world that you get to choose which one you're going to connect to or stand up for. They are mana, chronomancy, psionics, and anti-magic, which you can wield with over 20 new subclasses at least two for every core class in 5th edition. Legacy of Mana also introduces three new classes, the Sage, the Renic Knight, and the Psionicist. As well, it includes brand new feats, spells, and magic items. The campaign setting, the module book, and the amazing dice by Dispel Dice are available in both fantasy and anime variants. And some amazingly talented cr contributors have worked on this project, including Elsa Teague, Ed Greenwood, Keith Baker and Damian Haas. These are some of our favorite writers working in role-playing games, so this is sure to be an amazing setting and book. So follow the links down in the description below to back the Kickstarter today. And now, let's get to the builds. So these builds are going to work for your main character or your companions. We're going to suggest which companions they work particularly well for. As well, we're also going to go over three to four magic items that you can find early in Act 1 that are really, really powerful for that particular build. Note for those who are still in Act 1 of Baldur's Gate 3, when we talk about the magic items, we are going to be saying where they are located. So if you do want to avoid those spoilers, we will have spoilers at the bottom of the screen to let you know when that section is up. So with that, let's kick things off with our first build, which is a cleric build. You find Shadowheart as the first companion, and this is a great way to spec her, even if it's not entirely lore friendly at the start of the game. Shadowheart is one of the first companions you gain, and honestly, I only respect her once and never looked back, and she's just been a cleric the entire time, which actually makes it sound like it's reasonable if you're playing a cleric as well to follow the same build. And although Shadowheart presents herself as a trickery domain cleric, and that is in line with her whole lore, both Monty and I respect her as a light domain cleric. This allowed you to bring some of those key blaster spells into the game, as well as the beautiful uh, reaction ability to impose disadvantage on an attack, which in Baldur's Gate 3 comes up so much and is endlessly, you can use it endlessly, meaning that almost every time an enemy was attacking me, it would pop up on screen and say, hey, do you want to give them disadvantage? The answer is always yes. The Light Domain also has Radiance of the Dawn as its channel divinity power. This power is a huge AoE effect that does a great amount of damage, especially for dealing with low-level enemies like goblins that you face a lot early on in your adventures. When you respec Shadowheart or spec your cleric, you're going to want to put a 14 in Dexterity, a 16 in Constitution using a plus one, and you putting a 16 in Wisdom that starts at a 14, you put the plus two in, in there. The, the reason why we don't max out Wisdom right away with the ability scores is because we're going to be just putting our plus twos in there as we level up with this character at level four and level eight. And so we don't really benefit from having the odd ability score to bump up as soon as possible. On top of those really great abilities that Shadowheart gets, there's also the other phenomenal cleric spells such as Spirit Guardians and Spiritual Weapon. Spiritual Weapon doesn't do that much damage, but I have noticed more often than not, when I drop a spiritual weapon into the game, a lot of enemies spend their whole turns attacking it, which just means that my party isn't getting attacked. And Spirit Guardians does damage whenever something enters the area, which includes if you move towards the enemy. So I love just dropping Spirit Guardians on Shadowheart and having her run around the battlefield and everybody's getting damaged. Not to mention the Light Domain Cleric gets things like Fireball and Burning Hands, which 
made it feel really not essential to have a wizard in my party because most of the big damage spells were already on Shadowheart. Before you get to level 5 and get Spirit Guardians, your bread and butter is usually going to be just casting Bless on your allies and dropping that spiritual weapon and then bringing in whatever else you need from there. I miss with Sacred Flame all the time, so I often just default to Guiding Bolt instead. But you can also bring in other spells like Enhance Ability as well as the ubiquitous guidance so that you can ace all those ability checks really having a cleric in your party to cast guidance for every single ability check that comes up in the game is so valuable uh and it's really hard to ignore the the how much it comes up time and time and time again when you're playing through the game as a last note on running a cleric in Baldur's Gate 3, I will say that in, in an earlier Baldur's Gate video, we mentioned that healing isn't that great, and it's not great in tabletop, and it's not great here. I actually do think that healing has more of a place in Baldur's Gate 3 than it does at the table. At the table, there's not really a lot of penalties to just be like, okay, I'm casting a healing word on the person who's down and they're back up. But in Baldur's Gate 3, when you're doing this turn-based combat, it can actually be really detrimental to have a character go down, you raise them back up, and they actually lose their action for that turn. So although healing still isn't the greatest thing, having a healer in your party who can actually see somebody who's at like three hit points and say, oh, I'm going to boost them back up so they can survive another round, it might be the last round you need to win that combat. And I've done that more than a few times in Baldur's Gate 3. It's absolutely worth bringing Healing Word and Mass Healing Word. And that also gets more important as we talk about the items that you can equip this character with. So, a couple spoilers here. The first two items that you can get that are really amazing for this character actually are going to be buffing Healing Word and Mass Healing Word in a really big way. The first magic item that you should give to Shadowheart or yourself as a cleric is the Whispering Promise Ring. It's available at several different merchants in Act 1. And what the ring does is that whenever you cast a healing spell as the character wearing the ring, you also cast Bless on them at the same time. So they get the benefits of Bless as well as being healed. The Bless is concentration free. It does only last two turns, but if you're pumping out a bit of healing during combat, you don't have to concentrate on the Bless spell because you already have Bless going while you're healing your party. The other item that you can pair this with is a little bit tricky to find. It's called the Hellrider's Pride, and it's a pair of gloves that you can get from Zevlor if you remove Kaga as the leader of the Druids. There is a way to do this without killing the druids that involves exposing Kaga as a shadow druid. Otherwise, you can get the gloves if you kill her for Zevlor. The Hellrider's Pride gloves, like the Whispering Promise Ring, add an extra effect when you heal a target. In this case, the effect is resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for one round. And so these stack, so you can healing word an ally, giving them two rounds of bless and resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, piercing and slashing damage, and just send them right on into battle. And if you use mass healing word, it's going to apply to everybody that you heal, which is essentially your whole party. So by the time you're later in the game, you can be blessing and giving those damage resistances to your whole party just by simply bumping up their hit points. And in fact, I found this effect so powerful that in the later games, I would cast Mass Healing Word as a bonus action, which you can do at the same time as you're launching Spirit Guardians, even when my entire party was at full hit points, because resisting the damage before it happened and blessing the party was more valuable for my third level spell slot than actually the amount of hit points that Mass Healing Word restores. The last item for your Cleric or Shadowheart is the Luminous Armor, which is found in the Salunite Outpost in Act 1. This armor works with Radiant Damage, which if you're playing a Cleric, you're going to be doing a lot of. Your Spirit Guardians, your Channel Divinity, your Guiding Bolt, there's a lot of ways that you're going to be dishing out Radiant Damage. I even gave Shadowheart a Mace that does additional Radiant Damage. She rarely uses it, but if she does get in a situation where she's going to bonk somebody, at least it's doing radiant mm -hmm. damage. 
And what this armor set does is anything that's hit with radiant damage, it creates a burst of additional radiant damage and causes that creature to glow. It creates an orb above them. For every stack of this radiant orb that they have, they get a minus one penalty to their attack rolls. So not only are you causing them to glow and be visible and uh, stand out more on the battlefield, which I find helpful, but their ability to hit you just goes down. And when you combine all of those two items together... It's a huge swing. You can basically charge into a group with enemies with Shadow Heart, putting up Spirit Guardians, stacking up this Radiant Orb, giving them a massive attack penalty, and then mass healing word all your allies to give them a plus D4 to their attack rolls and saving throws and resistance to damage. And Shadow Heart will just clean up with this. An honorable mention on the note of the mace. There is a legendary mace, the Blood of Lathander, that you can find at the end of Act 1 in the Githyanki Kresh. If you give this mace to Shadowheart with the armor and all this this build, you will just be able to face roll through Act 2. The next build that we want to talk about is going to be our rogue or ranger build, depending on how you go. But uh, we're going to talk about kind of combining those two. And for me, this was my Asterian build. It's a good build for your PC as well, because you can build this character to fill a lot of different roles in dialogue too. Whether you're using Asterian to stick with as a rogue, or if you're going to change him into a ranger, or if you yourself are playing a ranger or rogue, the main idea here is that you want to be dual wielding hand crossbows. One of the things that you can do in Baldur's Gate 3 is there's not really any loading property for hand crossbows, so there's no limitations on dual wielding them and getting in your extra shots. This also helps because there are a lot of ways that you can get magic hand crossbows, and depending on your build, if you're the ranger or the rogue, there are ways to get additional shots out of those crossbows as well. This is going to be even more effective when we combine it with the sharpshooter feat, which lets you take a minus five penalty on the attack roll to get a plus 10 to the damage. And with a couple key pickups, we can compensate for that penalty, maybe having Shadowheart cast Bless on us. First, with your ability scores, regardless of whether you're going Ranger or Rogue, you're going to want to make your dexterity score 16 and probably your constitution score at 16 as well, by either putting a 14 in dex, giving it a plus two, 15 in con, giving that another plus one. And then you can kind of put your other stat points wherever else you want to from there. I went with, for Asterian, you can just give him a good wisdom score, but if it's your main character, you might want to put the remaining points in charisma and take some of the charisma-based skills to be the party face using the expertise from Rogue to boost that up further because this character is going to also be who we take Slate of Hand with to open locks and pickpockets. The, the key subclass choices here are that if you're going Ranger, you want to take Gloomstalker. Gloomstalker gets an extra attack on the first round of combat. And that means that you get three shots with your crossbow in the first round of combat. Much more of an opportunity to get in a sneak attack and to take out one or two enemies before combat's even really gotten going. But as a thief rogue, you get a full-on extra bonus action starting at level three, which means that this character can actually make three hand crossbow shots per turn every turn. So the Thief Rogue actually comes out on top in our books at third level, but you might want to be respecking between the two classes going forward because at level five, the Gloomstalker gets the full-on extra attack. So both these characters have kind of that extra damage. The Gloomstalker also brings things like Hunter's Mark, Longstrider, and Speak with Animals as part of their Ranger spells. So there's a bit of a trade-off there, but they're both so good, why not combine them? <laughs> And this, this does take you to the end of Act 1 and early into Act 2, but the idea here is that if you can combine these two elements together, especially if you can get to 5th level Gloomstalker with 3 levels of Thief Rogue, which is now probably into the start of Act 2. Solidly it's Act 2 at but, this point. But even if you're 4 levels of Gloomstalker and 3 levels of Rogue, or however you want to mix and match it, the idea here is that if you carry on as a Gloomstalker Thief rogue you're going to end up with a whole bunch of attacks as a rogue with sharpshooter 
dual wielding crossbows because if you have your extra attack from Gloomstalker and you have the additional bonus action as a thief rogue, it means that you are now making four attacks per round with the first round of combat giving you a fifth. And this is in addition to all the great skill expertises, the really useful ranger spells, and being able to have a source of invisibility for yourself. The Gloomstalker Ranger also gets Misty Step and Disguise Self, which are super useful spells all through the game for positioning. It really comes online early. It stays really good. And there's some really solid items that you can use to equip this character. We talked about how you want to get two hand crossbows for this character. And if you're lucky, you can buy them both from Damon in the camp of the Druids right away when you get there. I was lucky enough uh, on my second playthrough that Damon had a magic one and a mundane one. And I was able to buy them both right away. And at that point, you're kind of set up. Once you arrive in Grimforge, you're going to find the Firestoker hand crossbow, which does additional damage to burning enemies. Eventually in the game, more in Act 2, you can actually get a hand crossbow that sets targets on fire. So combining those two, setting them on fire, and then extra damage to the target that's on fire is really great. But early on, you can find some other pretty simple magic crossbows that uh, worked really well. The other item that is amazing for this character is the Caustic Band, which you can get from the Myconid Colony in the Underdark of Act 1. The Caustic Band is really simple. It adds two acid damage to all your weapon attacks. But when you're making four or five attacks, that's an extra 10 damage upwards of. It really adds up pretty quick. Uh, and it's a great, easy pickup for this, for this build. In the Gith Yankee Crash, you can also buy Gloves of Dexterity, which increase your dexterity to 18 and give you plus one to your attack rolls. This is great because with this build, you're probably only going to get one feat and you're going to want Sharpshooter with that. So you don't really get the opportunity to up your dexterity, but these gloves take care of that for you. You can even dump your dexterity to eight if you're going to cheese it and put those ability score points somewhere else. <laughs> that's that's what I ended up doing. I, I put the gloves on and then just respect my character to dump dexterity it's great because it's like you get a minus one but a plus four so it, it, it ends up evening out yeah we got some support and an amazing damage dealer as well but we probably need a little bit of a bruiser on the front lines and this is where i think karlak can really shine as a full-on barbarian we both love karlak she's awesome great personality and I love having her in a party because she's got some of the best quips as well. Yeah. She, she's just phenomenal. She's it, It's a shame because I think that she has the, the least payoff story-wise, but she's one of the best written characters in the game. Um, but Karlak's amazing, and having a barbarian is great. I went with uh, the Wildheart Barbarian. I went with the Berserker Barbarian. So Monty and I actually both have separate builds for Karlak, and I think both are incredible. I... I personally think that Karlak, although you can stick with Barbarian, towards the end of Act 1, I gave her two levels of fighter. Because then she gets Action Surge, which I think just helps boost her up a bit. And I, I think did a, a really good... Um, gave her a lot in terms of being able to dish out a lot of damage in the first few rounds of combat. If I am swarmed by enemies, she can take out four in a single turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, on the other hand, went with the Berserker because I wanted to have that frenzied throw power. Because with my Karlak build, we're going to do a bit of a throwing character. And this is where we have to talk about the items first, because the items are what make this build work. With Karlak, we're going to max out our strength. We want that 17 right away. So we're going to put 15 plus 2, 15 in Constitution plus two and a 14 in dexterity whatever else you put our other ability scores at doesn't matter her skills don't matter but what we're going to do is at level four we're going to take tavern brawler as the feat this is going to bump our strength to 18 and it's also going to add twice our strength modifier to the attack and damage rolls of thrown weapons now, you might be willing to throw your entire inventory at your enemies or throw your enemies at your enemies, but you don't have to. Because in Act 1, the vendor in the goblin camp sells a returning pike that comes back to you every time you throw it. And it's a magic weapon that does d10 damage base. We can combine this with a ring. You can buy the ring of flinging from the druids in Act 1. 
and a pair of gloves that you can also get from a quest in the Mykonid colony that add an, that both the ring and the gloves add another d4 to your thrown weapon damage. So in total, you have a weapon that does, it's ridiculous, like when you throw this pike, it just one shots whoever gets hit by it, and then it comes back, and you do it again with your extra attack, and you do it one more time with your frenzied throw. For myself, I went a little bit of a different direction with Karlak, but I think both of our builds are addressing the same problem. One of the biggest problems with a melee character in Baldur's Gate 3 is their maneuverability. A lot of combat encounters involve enemies in hard to reach areas, spread out pretty far, a lot of ranged combat from your enemies, and so you end up wasting a lot of time trying to get your melee combatants up to an enemy just to have them kill it in one hit and then have to spend their next action dashing to the next enemy. So Monty solved that by throwing his pike across the battlefield at his enemies. I solved that in a different way. When I was leveling up Karlak, I gave her two levels of fighter, the rest of the way barbarian. She also picked up great weapon master and polearm master. And I gave her, there's a lot of magical glaives in the game and mm. magical halberds and magical just great weapons that are that are awesome. And beyond that though, the most important things I gave her were boots of speed. The boots of speed are available in the Myconid colony and just allow you to dash as a bonus action. And because Karlak most of the time doesn't have anything to do with her bonus action, because of Great Weapon Master, when she's in the thick of it, she sometimes is able to kill an enemy and get that bonus action to hit another enemy, which is great. But when she's not in combat, the bonus action being used to just dash can get her into combat a lot faster. I actually find that I have almost no issue clearing an entire battlefield in one round and then still being able to dish out my multi-attack. Also from a vendor in the Mykonid colony is the Amulet of Misty Step, which I also gave to Karlak, because sometimes running isn't going to cut it and you have a group of enemies that are up on a ledge or somewhere that's hard to get to. And again, Karlak can Misty Step and then continue to run after that. So really, I with those two items, giving her a Magic Glaive and giving her the two levels of fighter, she can get into combat no problem and then dish out sometimes three to five attacks if I want to use action surge. And she can clear a battlefield pretty quickly. A great two-handed weapon to get for Karlak early in the game, which will carry you through early on really, really well, is the Everburn Blade. And that comes from the tiefling boss that's on the Nautiloid. And you don't actually have to kill him to get it. Instead, if you get if you rescue Shadowheart from her pod and prepare the command spell, you can use it on the tiefling commander to force him to drop the blade and then have someone run by and pick it up. And so if you you get two chances to get him to drop it because Shadowheart has two spell slots and it's about a 55% chance for him to fail the save, so it's a good odds or better odds if you're save scumming. Uh, to get this this sword, and uh, it does an extra d4 burning damage. It's a great two-handed weapon for the early part of the game to give to Karlak, and it just slaps. I will also say that it is possible, I tested this myself, it is possible to kill the tiefling before the reinforcements show up. It's, it's tough, yeah. but the tiefling actually will only attack the uh, Mind Flayer. So they'll keep duking it out and the Mind Flayer will ignore you, the Tiefling will ignore you, and I got all three of my party members because I had Lizelle, myself, and Shadowheart, and they grouped up around the Tiefling and all just kept picking away at him. And just as he died, two more of these Tieflings yeah. showed up and I just grabbed the blade and beelined past the other enemies to, to grab the cord and end the combat encounter. But I managed to get the blade. So the last build is the build that took me through the entire game on my first playthrough and is so good I'm playing it again on my second with Dark Urge. And this is the Sorlock build. Uh, but you're going to want to start out just as a plain old Warlock and take Eldritch Blast, take Hex, and take Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast and have a blast blasting your enemies off cliffs with Eldritch Blast. <laughs> Act 1 has so many cliffs, and if you have Will in your party, Will can fill this role, or if you want to play a Warlock, or heck, if both of you want to be Warlocks, there's nothing wrong with extra blasting power that knocks people around. 
The fact that there are so many cliffs in the game and Eldritch Blasting enemies off of them just kind of ends combat encounters. Early in Act 1, I fought a hag, and it was, I think, supposed to be a much tougher battle, but I blasted her into the pit in the middle of the room. Yeah, but unfortunately, that means that you didn't get to bargain with her for the plus one ability score hair. I did not, because I blasted <laughs> her into a pit, and that was the end of it. So this is one of the key things to not do, because uh, you can, if you spare the hag you can get an item that uh, you can bargain with her and get plus one to one of your ability scores, which is great for this character specifically because you can do 17 charisma and get the plus one. And then with all the multi-classing you're going to do with them, it's going to be a little bit later before you get a feat. So I quite, quite like bargaining with them. Maybe don't blast the hag into a pit, but you can. And that's what's important. <laughs> I do think that like when we get into actually adding the sorcerer on top of the warlock, this just gives you access to meta magic, more spell slots, so you can actually drop great concentration spells, blast your enemies into those concentration spells as well as off of cliffs. And it's it's just a great build. The Warlock really comes out as a powerful contender in this game. And if you just stick with a warlock through all of Act One, it's probably worthwhile. But two levels of Warlock is kind of all you need because as long as you have Eldritch Blast, it automatically scales at level 5 and 10 to get its extra beams. And so I start off with just those two levels of Warlock. My Charisma is 17, my Constitution is 16, my Dexterity is 14. And I take those first two levels, which having your first two levels as Warlock really helps just get you through those first two levels. Then at level 3... You want to take your level of sorcerer, but what's important here is that you actually want to respec your character so your first level is sorcerer and then you have two levels of warlock. The reason for this being is that sorcerers get proficiency in constitution saving throws. So doing this gets you that. I went with a dragon sorcerer as well, which gives you the extra hit points and the AC boost. And if you play a half elf or a human, you also get proficiency in shields, which means that you can have AC 17 as a third level Sorcerer Warlock, which is pretty good to get you through the early game as well. Um, you're not that squishy with, with this build either. And then from there, you're just going to go, war you're, you're just going to be happy with your two Warlock levels and go Sorcerer the rest of the way, picking up Twin Spell, Quicken Spell, and whatever other magic, meta magic excites you along the way. And pretty much, if all you do with this character is cast Eldritch Blast and Twin Haste on yourself and Asterion, uh, you're probably going to face roll most, most fights in the game. <laughs> now, there's a lot of magic items that you might want to give to this character, and uh, where do we start? So, it takes a little while for the magic items to really come online for this character, and it relies on a couple specific interactions. If you choose the lightning-based Draconic Ancestries. You get to add your Charisma modifier to lightning-based elemental damage. But Eldritch Blast does force damage. However, there's a staff that you can get in Act 1 um, from Joaquin's Rest, from rescuing the Counselor from the fire, called the Spell Sparkler. And it causes when you ca deal damage with spells, you gain lightning charges. And when you have lightning charges, you get a plus one to hit, and your attacks deal an extra one lightning damage. Well, it turns out that this extra one lightning damage gets the full charisma bonus from the the dragon sorcerer, lightning, and then it applies to every beam of Eldritch Blast. And then there's a necklace called the Necklace of Elemental Aug Augmentation that you can get from the Githyanki Kresh that also adds another... your your spellcasting ability modifier to your lightning damage and so you can end up with a situation where your eldritch blasts are getting this extra one lightning damage added to them that is now letting you add your charisma modifier to it again and again and again right so then yeah. if it's plus five so then it is plus 16 on top of your eldritch it, blast it, it what I'll say is it's actually really weird how Baldur's Gate 3 is calculating this extra damage. And all I can say is that it, it feels like the Eldritch Blast is just like I've easily done 100 damage with a single casting of Eldritch Blast at higher levels. In the mid, in the mid levels, it's, it's a little bit less. So the, I feel like the Spell Sparkler and the Necklace of Elemental Augmentation are kind of the first two 
kind of flagship items that I found really boosted the damage this character did. And so for the most part, I was just using like scrolls and, and other stuff to, to get some extra spells to use and whatever I can find through the rest of the act. Between these four builds, Monty and I did a different variation on these for each of our playthroughs, but it was funny that when we came together, we essentially came up with the same yeah. core four concepts. And I think that that, that says a lot about uh, how useful they are in Baldur's Gate 3, and they come online really early. And these are ones that you can ride out through the entire game. And unfortunately, I'm really sorry, Gale, but you kind of become come obsolete with all of these options on the table yeah yeah gail spent most of both my playthroughs waiting in camp yeah sorry man yeah. you seem like a nice guy but i just don't know much about you other than yeah your brief plot lines that you forced on me yeah um and of course there's some higher level builds that you can do by you know doing a paladin warlock i find that that takes a little while to come online there's a couple variants that you can do for the Gloomstalker Thief Hand Crossbow build that involve bard levels as well, but that's also a much more higher level build too. But these four really felt like builds that you could kind of start with and play through the entire game with. I do think that there is room, and let us know if you want this, uh, but we would look at taking these builds into the higher level and what we might do in a multi-class, maybe a third level or like a third subclass, a class in there, and uh, just see what high level end game builds we might be able to make. We included discussion of the magic items that you can find for these builds in this video. So let us know if you enjoyed that part of the video as well. And we'll continue to give lists of recommended items and where you can find them for the various builds in Baldur's Gate 3. We don't normally do item recommendations for our builds in D&D because there's no way to control for that with your dungeon master. But in Baldur's Gate 3, where you can always find the same items in the same place, it's pretty easy to talk about them in the context of our builds. And in many cases, the itemization in Baldur's Gate 3 makes certain builds possible. So we think it's an important thing to talk about. But let us know how you feel about that in the comments below. We're really enjoying Baldur's Gate 3 and we hope to cover more content. So if you like our build ideas or us talking about the items, tell us what some of your favorite subjects are that you want us to go into more detail on in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the content that we create and want to see more of it, please consider becoming a patron of our show. It really helps us make these videos possible. And if you want to support us, make sure to hit the super thanks button down below. Also, if you want to check us out playing Dungeons and Dragons, you can check us out in the world of Drakenheim, which is Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes of that right up over here. we got plenty more videos about Baldur's Gate 3 and D&D right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.